tears, no more sadness. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 13 tonight. I'm going to continue where I left off this morning. I love to do that. We're just going to preach through the book of Mark, eventually get there, not setting no dates, no time. I'm glad y'all don't set any time on me. I told Brother Jerry last night, I said, take about 20 minutes, but take as long as the Holy Spirit wants you to preach, because I don't set times on preachers. Amen. Y'all don't set times on me. That's good. Amen. But uh, we thought it was going to be outside where it would be hot, dark, and rainy. And I said, take about 10 minutes out there because that's about all you're going to get out of these men. And we had a wonderful fellowship. Wonderful. Appreciate so much. Um, everyone in attendance. And thank you for bringing visitors. And uh, we're going to do this every quarter. It's the Men's Fellowship Supper. Okay. Men's Fellowship Supper. You got that? And we're going to have... Uh, that at night because some of y'all can't be at the breakfast at 7.30, so I felt bad about that. I want to include you every quarter on a supper. So uh, we're, going to eat, uh, we're going to eat and fellowship, preach, and pray. Uh, not in that order, but we're going to, in, of importance. This morning I preached on the signs of the time, and it was amazing to me that even to the minute detail in A.D. 70, uh, every stone was turned up. Every huge rock was flipped over because Titus ordered the men not to burn the temple, but they did. Then after they burned the temple, the gold uh, seeped down into the cracks of every foundational stone. <clears throat> so they thus had to turn every rock and every stone upside down because of their greed to get the gold. Sounds just like man, don't it? Praise God right there. 
And uh, that's why it's so beautiful. The Word of God comes true exactly as, as the Lord prophesied. But this is also for us today to know that we're in the last times. Amen? I believe we're in the very last times. And I believe that there's no doctrine, <clears throat> no doctrine at all, that should change our behavior like believing that the Lord is coming any minute. And that's why I requested that song, and Brother Randy's got more guts, more intestinal fortitude, more courage than any song leader I've ever known in my life. I'll just suggest a song, and he'll sing it. It don't matter if he knows it or if he comes close to it. He's going to sing it, amen? And y'all did a fine job on that beautiful song that I've never seen, never heard until I uh, heard the words uh, this week in some preaching. And so let's stand on the Word of God. Uh, I like that verse 2 where it said that they were trying to be impressive. Jesus had cleaned the temple. Uh, he had rebuked the Pharisees. He would answered all these silly questions they had about uh, divorce and remarriage in heaven, about uh, taxes and taxation and rendering authority to Caesar and tried to trip him, but they never did. And then he was pretty rough on them. And then they said, well, aren't, don't you think this is a beautiful place? And they tried to calm it down a little bit, I believe. And Jesus answered and said to them, Seest thou this great building? There shall not be left. Verse 2, 13, chapter 13. There'll not, be, there'll not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Came true exactly A.D. 70. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew answered him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign? He answered the second question in these verses. All these things shall be fulfilled. And Jesus answered them, began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. We shall hear wars and rumors of wars. Be ye not troubled. Thank God for peace in the midst of war. For such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nations shall rise against nations, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in divers places. There shall be famines and, tr and troubles. Uh, those are the beginning of the sorrows. That's birth pains. But take heed to yourself, for they shall deliver you up to the councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before the rulers for, uh, and kings for my sake. And I want you to notice these next three words, for a testimony against them. And here's my text tonight. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in, in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. It's not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brothers shall betray brother to death. That's sad. And father's son, that's even sadder. And children shall rise up against their parents. That's most indeed sad. And shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for this last great commission that you gave the disciples in very treacherous and persecuting times to take the gospel. God, may we in these last days, and I believe we're in the last days of the last days, God, before the rapture, may we take the gospel, not only through Brother Keith Shoemaker to West Africa, but God, may we take the gospel to our neighbors, our workmates, our relatives, our friends, God, all that we come in contact with. May we, dear God, learn to be effective witnesses. But God, may we be reminded of this verse that it's not us that speaks, but it's you. And so God, help us to be yielded vessels, mouthpieces crying in the wilderness of these last days, the gospel. Thank you for the gospel. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. You know, as I preach on the signs of the time, we're all thrilled about the Lord coming. But you know, behind uh, 
all the thrill and all the joy and all the worship, there's work to do. Amen. There's a duty. Uh, there's a commission. We've got something to do, and I'm glad I got something to do. I'm a doing person. I like to stay busy. I can't keep up with Brother Larry Styles, but praise God I'm trying on these grounds. But I'll tell you this, friend. I thank God that God has called us to be a witness, that God's called us to take the gospel. There is no way on this earth that I'd be happy about my dear daughter and my grandchildren that I miss very much being across the world, Miss Corley, without knowing that they're there for the gospel. I wouldn't send them for business. I wouldn't send them for some sports team. That'd be ridiculous. I'd just tell my son-in-law, get right with God, you're staying here in good old Dalton, Georgia. But for the gospel, but for the gospel. Folks, we must get the gospel to people. The gospel is good news, but it's not good news to those that's never heard. It's not good news to those that's never heard. And so many people have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. This morning I could tell those parents were listening very intently. And I could tell also they hadn't heard a clear presentation of the gospel in a long time. You say, oh, that couldn't happen in Dalton, Georgia. Oh, yes, it can. And folks, I thank God for the gospel and I thank God for the command that if we're in the last days, we need to take the gospel no matter what the cost. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. We live in good days to witness. We don't have brothers turning against brothers and daddies against children and children against daddies. We don't have uh, uh, being um, brought before the trials and, and persecuted and, and beat. Um, we don't have that today. The uh, best thing, probably the most thing we can get hurt while we go take the gospel is our feelings. But, and sometimes people won't even go with the gospel because they're afraid that they'll be hurt. Well, I want to tell you something, friend. I'm not looking for a fight, and I'm not looking for somebody to, to, to uh, be rude and rash and, and hurt somebody and get in a debate. I'm here to declare the gospel. And folks, the gospel's worth declaring, but I'll say the gospel's worth sacrificing for. And many people have died for us to have the gospel, and many people have died for us to take the gospel. Many people have sacrificed their homes and their across the seas and they're in distant lands and they're away from their families and they're very homesick for the gospel. I'm telling you the reason the gospel is good news. And folks, I believe God has commanded us in the light of the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to take the gospel to a lost and dying world before it's eternally too late. I believe time's running out. And I believe we ought to take the gospel gratefully, thankfully, joyfully, and thank God urgently to a lost and dying neighbor, to a lost and dying friend. You know, I believe that the Christian life can be summed up as coming and going, coming and going. You know, the, the disciples were called to come unto him before they were decided, uh, commissioned to go out for him. We come to worship. But why do we come to worship? We come to worship to be filled with the Spirit of God. But then we go and share from our heart of an overflowing grateful spirit and praise the gospel. I see number one, the theme of the proclamation in Mark chapter 13 verse 10. It says in the gospel, the theme's the gospel. It's good news. No matter what the circumstances, no matter how hard it is, and folks, no matter how risky it is and how much persecution is there, he was telling his disciples, hey, listen, I've got a commission. I want to commission you because, folks, soul salvation is the greatest need of all mankind. Amen? Soul salvation is the greatest need of all mankind. You tell me another thing that men and ladies and boys and girls need more than the gospel. And I'll say, go do it. They don't need new buildings. They don't need uh, reformation. They don't need more money. They don't need more career. They don't need to think more of themselves. We've got too much of that going on. They need the gospel. They need to realize the good news is that Jesus died for their sins. And praise God, they don't have to go to hell. They can go to heaven. And no matter what it takes, we need to live a life that presents the gospel. I see the time of the proclamation. It says, must first be published. Look at the verse, verse 10, must first be published. I see not only the proclamation of the gospel, 
But I see the priority of the gospel. Folks, he sent them out to give their lives, and they became witnesses, and the Greek word for witness is martyr. And they sent, he sent, sent them out to first proclaim the gospel. And there was judgment falling. And folks, there was a lot of religion and a lot of false prophets and a lot of earthquakes and a lot of people proclaiming to be Christ and people giving their lives for those uh, false prophets and false messiahs. It was rampant back then and it's rampant today. If you don't believe it, drive down Doug Gap Road and see how many cults you pass before you come to an old-fashioned fundamental Baptist church. Amen. Thank God we're here. And I hope we'll always be here. And then I see number three, the territory of the proclamation. Be published among all nations. In spite of difficult times, the gospel must be brought to the entire world. Amen. And folks, I appreciate your missionary heartbeat. And folks, the go, the go is part of the gospel. You take the go out of gospel and all you got is a spell. There's a lot of people that just come for a spell. They want to come for a spell and they leave after a spell. But I'm not talking about that kind of spell. I'm talking about feelings and emotion and, and the contemporary movement is, is entertainment. And friend, I want to tell you something. God's called us to come, but God's called us to go. And time's almost up. I remember when I was taking some tests back in college, if I can remember some of them, and we, there would always be some of these times where there'd be time tests. Those made me nervous, especially typing time tests. I hated typing. I went to typing class to be, in the, to be in the class with all the cheerleaders. I'll confess my sin. They were in there. I thought, well, praise God, the athletes ought to be in there too. I'll take this little old thing. And we had the typewriters that you put the crank down and you flip it. You know, flip it. And I got that time test and I had 15, er 15 words over nine errors and I thought I was burning it up and all of a sudden the thing stopped. I raised my hand and said, teacher, this thing has malfunctioned. And she hit that little lever. Went back to that. I got so nervous I forgot to hit the little lever. Now thank God for computers, amen. But I remember, I, I, I remember that teacher would say, time's up. And I want to tell you something, friend, after this morning, I believe the Holy Ghost is telling me, time's about up. It's time to get busy. It's time to publish the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. It's time to be a bold witness. But thank God, a gracious and merciful, long-suffering God's calling us with a brief window of opportunity to take the gospel. That's why Jesus came. That's why we ought to go. Why did Jesus give us the gospel? Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All. Thank God. Why should we believe the gospel? Because one day there'll be no more opportunity. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says we'll believe a lie. Remember I told you the author of false prophets this morning was the liar and the liar is the devil? Well, I'm going to tell you something. During the tribulation, you think you might have another chance? If you've heard the gospel, you won't have another chance. Matter of fact, you will believe a lie if you've heard the gospel before the rapture. And you'll be, have the strong delusion. And friend, I want to tell you something. Time's running out for those that are lost. It's going to be too late. It's going to be one day too late. They're going to be left behind. And folks, so we, need to, we need to take the gospel because Jesus is not willing any should perish. We need to take the gospel because time is running out for the lost. And we need to take the gospel because the uniqueness of the gospel is the power unto salvation. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. I like to preach verse by verse, but sometimes... I have to just stop with one verse and preach a textual message and give you a lot of scripture with it. But Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Folks, why should we be ashamed of what saved us? Why should we be ashamed of Jesus? Why should we be ashamed of how we got in, how we got saved? And it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now listen to this. For it is the power of God unto salvation. I love the um, origin of the gospel. It's the gospel of Christ. 
It's not the gospel of Mary Baker, Eddie, George, whatever her name was, that's been married five times, gave away her four-year-old, and believes in animal magnetism, curses mentally, and Tom Cruise and all of them can go worship that junk if they want to. But folks, that's not the gospel. Christian science is not the gospel. Jehovah Witness is not the gospel. Hey, friend, Mormonism is not the gospel. I don't care how many golden tablets and how many times he loses his glasses, it's not the gospel. Say amen. Humanism is not the gospel. You try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps or your suspenders. I'm having a hard time with my suspenders. I'm a pessimist. I believe I'm the only preacher that wears suspenders and a belt too. Amen. You'll get that later. But I'm, thank God. I thank God that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Say amen. I thank God I'm not basing it on Wayne Cofield, any, any Phil, any person, any preacher, any prophet. I'm basing it on the gospel of Christ. The origin ought to get you excited. It ought to make you bold. It ought to make you excited about sharing the gospel. In the days of the kings and the emperors and the uh, mighty men that they worshipped as God in the Roman Empire, there'd be heralds that come out, Brother Harold, There'd be heralds that come out. They'd say, hear ye, hear ye, a message from the king. And all the village would stop. They would have to be because it was a death sentence not to listen to the message from the king. They could put you in jail or they could cut your head off. And they'd stop and he would say, here's an announcement. Brother Jason, don't you wish they'd give you that kind of attention? But amen. Then here's an announcement. We have them on the wall, we have them in the bulletin, and we give them five minutes every service, and some of y'all still don't get the announcements. <laughs> Let's just preach a little about listening. Hey, man, no. I mean, we can't do anything else. I guess we could email them to you. I guess we could put them on Facebook. You'd notice it then, praise God. I know you'd notice it then. But, folks, I want to tell you something. When there's a message from the king, it's worth sharing. The origin of the gospel. Then look at it. It says, it says uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I see the outcome of the gospel. It's power. It's dynamite. It's a life-changing message. Folks, remember the day you got saved. I want you to go back to that place and that time. Where was you when God saved you? And if somebody witnessed to you appropriately, they gave you the gospel. And maybe their testimony, and I'll get to that in just a minute. And it says, to everyone that believeth, there's the outreach of the gospel. Amen. Muslims can get saved. South Africans can get saved. The British can get saved. Every time I round Corley, I think of the British. Amen. I'm glad she didn't get up here and click and clack with the coastal language. I'm sure that's, she, can, she can speak four or five languages. I speak two. Billy in English, amen. <laughs> I'm proud of my heritage too, praise God. Hill Billy in English. But I want to tell you something, friend. There's a language that everybody needs to hear. There's a message that everybody needs to hear. It's just not fair. That's what my grandkids always say. Papa, it's just not fair. I said, do I look like a referee? It, it might not be fair, but you're going to get this and you're going to get that. <laughs> you can tell I'm real tough for my grandchildren, praise God. But folks, I want to tell you something. We hear it 10,000 times and they've never heard it once. We hear it every day. We turn on five radio stations and hear four versions of it. And some people have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Folks, give your children to missions. Give your heart for missions. Give your money to missions. Give your time for missions. Because we're running out of time. Time up. Oh, no. The typewriter's stopped. It's much more important than that. We're running out of time. We're in the last days. And I want to give you this tonight. If we're in the last days and you believe it's the last days, you ought to change your life. Say amen. The king's coming and we're going to give account of what we did with what we had opportunity to do. Teach and preach the gospel, yes, but go door knocking. 
That's an old term we used to have when I first started this church. We're going to go door knocking. What does that mean? Just go knock on somebody's door and run? No, that means take the gospel. Amen. Ask Brother Bill Goins if he believes the gospel is important. He's printing some tracts for Brother Larry to take to the prisoners. He believes it's important. He even put Brother Larry's picture in color. That has to be important. Amen. And his testimony is on that great track. And he goes up there every day almost in those hard cells and those hard-hearted prisoners and takes them to gospel. Yes, they got the tattoo, born to lose, but we know better. They're born to win. They're born to be born again. <laughs> Amen. They're born for the glory of God. And we can take the good news. God loves you. And he loved you so much, he died for you. And praise God, he receded it so much, three days later, up from the grave he arose. That's the gospel. That's good news. But it's not good news if they never heard the good news. Let me close with saying this. Every believer is to go with the gospel. I want you to turn to Psalms 107, verse 1 and 2. In closing. Now don't pack up because you know I love to close and close and close. The only reason I say that is I really want to start preparing to close. And so I'm helping myself. And y'all better thank God for that. Amen. Because I could preach an hour on this subject and then take it up again. Here it is. Psalms 107 verse 1. And here's the key to witness. I believe that I'm giving you the key to effectively sharing the gospel in the last days. It's probably summed up in these first three words. Psalms 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. Can somebody say amen right there? A colon means amen. For his mercy... Endureth forever. And then here's the challenge. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I want you to underline the word, two words, say so. Say so. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I believe the reason we do not witness like we should is our hearts not full of gratefulness. We've just plain got over it. Remember when you first got saved? What did you want to do? Go out and party? Go home and have the same old life? No, I wanted to tell all my friends, and most of them were in that church at that time, I got saved. I looked up, and Alfie was sitting on the fourth row, and he'd always elbowed me every service. Aren't you glad the Holy Ghost is the elbower from within? And I looked at him, and his tears were streaming down his face because his cousin got saved. That set off an alarm in my soul, and I started crying like a baby. I was 12 years old almost. I was trying to impress all the girls. I had a problem there. I was trying to impress girls at 12. That's better than impressing boys. Say amen. Come on. I ain't going there. But friend, I cried and boo-hooed. And then I looked up at my mama. She'd suffered, been through so much to keep us in church. And I looked up at my daddy. He happened to be there that night. He looked up, and you could tell in his heart he was grateful that his son got saved. I remember the night. I remember the place. Daryl, your birthday, March 15th. Out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. Look at Psalms 147, verse 1. Psalms 147, verse 1. Well, I really don't believe in praising God. 
Well, you might not really be even praising God, but you ought to be believing and sharing the gospel gratefully as an act of worship. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. You know what that means? God loves you to praise Him. And folks, it's very important we praise God in this sanctuary. And sanctuary, is learned, we learn from Brother Stenet Blue, it's not an auditorium, nobody's auditioning for a thing. It's a sanctuary, it's set aside for God's purpose, amen? It's important you praise God here. But I think it's more important that you praise God to the lost. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm getting it real simple tonight. We need to speak out of an overflow of a grateful heart. Did you hear me? We need to speak out of an overflow of a grateful heart. Where would you be tonight? Some of you would be in hell. And I know a lot of you wouldn't be in church. A lot of you would be bored with life, sick of the society, and just pitiful. But the Lord saved you. His mercy endureth forever. And folks, it's not a canned presentation. I've been accused of that. A dear friend of mine that I baptized when he was nine years old was trying to lash out in a sermon one time and said, I believe that some fundamental independence has a one, two, three presentation. I went up after him and said, yeah, I believe in one, two, three presentation, but I believe in four God's Holy Spirit convicts and uses the Word of God. So if you're looking at me, I ain't a canned presentation. Amen? But you know, folks, I don't like canned music, and I sure don't like canned witnessing. I believe we ought to know the verses. I believe we ought to praise God, have a plan. But I want to tell you something, friend. The greatest thing you could ever do is knock on the door with a grateful heart. Greatest thing you can ever do. Let me tell you my story. I was lost and now I'm saved. My daddy was going to hell and now he's in heaven. Amen. And I saw that word testimony in Mark chapter 13. It's a testimony against them. But folks, the greatest testimony you have is for him. Not against them. Yes, your testimony should be a light. Your testimony ought to be a salt. Your testimony ought to make a difference and there ought to be a difference in your testimony or keep your mouth shut. Amen. But I want to tell you something, friend. Just praise the Lord to other people. Just praise the Lord to the lost and dying world. You want to open up her heart, Pete? Go home and praise the Lord. You want to open up her heart, Pete? When trouble and trial hits, just praise the Lord. You want to open up her heart? Because he was in prayer request room, and, and I'm just sharing this. Just, just keep being faithful. Don't second guess yourself. Let God touch your heart. And folks, it's not going to be going home like I used to do with my daddy and preach the sermon over again and hit him over the head with the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Is this going home and saying, God's good. God loves me. God saved me. God's made a difference. And God's real. Daddy, God's real. If you can't see it, I'm backslidden. But God's real. And then live it and love him and heap coals of fire upon even your enemies. And God will melt them. His Holy Ghost is the way we witness. But I want to tell you what the Holy, who the Holy Ghost is. He is the witness. I'm trying to help you on your witness. I'm trying to help me. He said, don't worry about it. Don't pre, pre, re, rehearse it and premeditate on it. Get so nervous you're some canned presentation. Just give me a testimony. It'll be a testimony against them but it'll definitely be a testimony for him. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I believe the more that people go out happy and rejoicing in the Lord 
and His goodness and His mercy. As Titus 2, chapter 10, chapter 2, verse 10 says, we can adorn our doctrine. You know what that means? Makes it beautiful. Some people alliterate the doctrine. Some people preach the doctrine. Some people teach the doctrine. I believe we ought to praise the doctrine. I believe we ought to go out and say, hey, thank God I got the word. I don't have to have my personality. I don't have to have my, my presentation. I got God's word and I got God's mercy. I got God's goodness. I got, I'm going to heaven and I want you to go too. Praise the Lord. We beautify it. We adorn it. Other than the gospel, the most powerful tool, I believe, back in Mark chapter 13 real quick. It says in verse 9, Ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. But we ought to do all the gospel preaching and teaching and sharing and witnessing for his sake. It's for him, not us. We're not trying to build a church here. We're trying to build the kingdom of God up. We're trying to reach people. They're going to hell without Jesus. Boys and girls and men and ladies that do not trust the Lord are going to hell. Does that move you? You're going to heaven. Does that move you? Come and go. Praise the Lord and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Other than the gospel, I believe the most powerful tool you have is your testimony. Your testimony is your story. No one can give it like you can give it. No one can share it like you can share it. The number one excuse I hear over all these years, and I believe we're a soul one in church, I believe that's the way it started, I believe it's the way it'll continue. I try to get out of the office every week and try to witness. We're not careful, we'll get locked in on the administration of the church. That's not my calling. My calling is to be a witness of the gospel, the grace of God. And folks, I want to tell you something. A lot of people say, well, I would go, but I don't know what to say. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a missionary. I can't go. I don't know what to do. It's fear. I don't blame you, but I want to tell you what you can do. If you've been saved, you know how you got saved. Amen? And it's always appropriate. I believe it's a great starting point. But let me share what God's done in my life. And I don't think it ought to be, I can't figure it out, 50-year-old testimony, 1964. I don't think it ought to be a 50-year-old testimony. I think it ought to be God's blessed this week. God's helped me this week. God's answered this prayer this week. God's been good to me this week. God spoke to my heart and devotion this morning. Let me just share with you how real God is to me. That gets people's attention because they're not looking for your canned presentation. They're looking for reality. And they're looking for help. And they're looking for Jesus. And then when you get bogged down, it's a good time to just go to your testimony. Folks, there's a common thread all through the Gospels of people that shared their testimony. Look real quick, Mark chapter 5, verse 19. Mark chapter 5, verse 19. And how be it Jesus suffered him not but to say unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee has had compassion on thee. Thank God a Gadarean maniac streaking through a country gave, graveyard didn't have a lick of control, a lick of sense. I mean, demon possessed got saved. He said, I'm going to stay here and sit at your feet. He said, no, you're not. You're going home and you're going to tell everybody what I have done for you. Amen. Testimony. Luke chapter 2, verse 17. You know the story very well. The angels at the birth of Christ thank the Lord 
He said, and when they had seen it, they made known abroad the sayings which was told them concerning this child. He said, I want to just tell you what I've seen, what I've heard, and who I met. John chapter 4, verse 20, 39, the saying of the woman reached a multitude. He says, come see a man that knew all about me. <laughs> Save my soul. I was a prostitute. I didn't have nothing to offer God. And Jesus saved me. And he, she, came, she came back with a bunch of men. I wonder why she knew a bunch of men. Said, I got to see who changed this lady's life. She shared her testimony. I met him. He knew all about me. He loved me. In Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Look at it real quick. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Give me about 10 more minutes. We had a good Lord's Supper. I'm going to take a little time here. Acts chapter, how many is in a hurry? Say amen. It would be amazing if somebody hollered out, amen. We'd overlook you. But look at this. Verse 6 says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Such as I have I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Thank God they went back. They went, that this man went and started praising God and he and praising and, and walking, but not only walking, verse, verse 9, but praising God. I wonder how many people he reached. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 20. The Bible says, We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Amen. Amen. Folks, the Bible says, as as much as in me. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The origin of the gospel, the outreach of the gospel, the urgency of the gospel, the unction of the gospel. 1 Peter 3, 15 says, be always ready to give an answer. Amen. And then last but not least, going back to what we read in the Old Testament. Psalms 107. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom you have redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Let me ask you a question. I'll close. I promise you. I'll have you out of here by 9 o'clock Alabama time. Have you had your sins forgiven? Well, then say so. Do you know the Savior personally? Then say so. Has the love of God become real to you? Then say so. Is heaven your destination? Is heaven your home? Has Jesus saved some of your loved ones? I share my daddy's testimony as much as I share my own. Because it was one of the greatest days of my life. On his deathbed, he said this. He said, Wayne, only regret I have is I only lived seven years. Tell the young people not to wait till they're 63 and die when they're 70. I only lived seven years, he said, crying on his deathbed. He said, tell them. Tell them not to wait. And for 36 years, I've been going to the YDC. And folks, a lot of times, it just comes out. Not because my daddy told me so. But I ain't never got over my daddy being saved. I've never got over that night. And those years and years of praying... And seeing him come home and read his Bible. And come home unexpectedly and have breakfast with mom and daddy. And see him get up from the table and hug mother and say, I love you. And he looked at me and said, I love you. And he never said that before he was saved. But old friend, if you ain't got a testimony, sure you got a testimony of somebody that you've reached. Or that God's saved in your family. But if heaven's your home and hell's not your home, say so.
say so. If God is your father and Jesus is your everlasting companion and best friend, then say so. There's five gospels according to Vance Havner. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you. And some people never pick up the, the book of Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, or John, but they'll read you like a book. So say so. C.H. Spurgeon gave his testimony 300 times in his sermons. The prince of pre preachers, the most eloquent preacher that ever walked this earth, they say, the prince of preachers. 300 times he went back to the day he got saved. Just say so. So in the last days, there's an urgent call to people to take the gospel and your testimony to a lost and dying world. And I can just hear it. Time is up. Put your pencils down. Stop your typing. But I'm not going to hear no time is up with my little lecture teacher. I'm going to hear a trumpet. And time's going to be up. There'll be no more time to witness. There'll be no more people getting saved. And praise God, I'm going to face Jesus and say, Lord, I said so. I gave him the gospel. I carried my Bible as as precious to me as the smartphone. Whew, it's getting quiet now. I wouldn't leave home without it. I packed it. Put it in my purse. That's you ladies, not me. Put it in my pocket. Put it in my jeans. Put it in my truck. Put it in my car. Put it in my heart. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this lesson on witnessing for the last days. As that old song said, faithful and true would be, would he be found find us if he should come today. Watching in gladness, not in fear, if he should come today. Signs of his coming multiplied. Oh, if he should come today.